Support for this podcast comes from Progressive Insurance with Snapshot, which monitors mileage and safe driving habits to determine a personalized rate. Learn more at Progressive.com. This is Fresh Air. I'm Dave Davies in for Terry Gross. It's been a good couple of years for comic Louis C.K. In 2011, GQ named him the Comic Genius of the Year, and he took a chance with his latest stand-up special, Live at the Beacon Theater, bypassing the usual HBO or Comedy Central route to viewers, and instead put it out exclusively on his own website for $5 a download. The experiment worked, making over a million dollars and giving CK the freedom to put out his special on his own terms. Since then, it's also aired as a comedy special on FX. And his FX series Louis is returning for a third season next week. Time magazine named Louie the best TV show of the year in its 2011 wrap-up, calling it an R-rated, painfully funny meditation on life as something ridiculous, terrible, and beautiful. Louis C.K. created the series, writes and directs it, and stars as a comic named Louie, who, like C.K., is a divorced father of two young girls. Terry spoke with Louis C.K. in December, soon after the second season of his FX series wrapped up. It's now out on DVD. The new season starts Thursday. Louis C.K., welcome back to Fresh Air. It is so great to have you back. So um, your second season of your Mm -hmm. FX series, Louis, was fantastic. And um, it was so much about the lives of comics. I I just found that theme so fascinating. So I want to play a a couple of examples. One of them deals with Dane Cook, who's, Mm -hmm. as most people know, a very famous comic, super successful. And um, in this episode... You're still playing clubs. He's super successful. Your daughter really wants tickets to a Lady Gaga concert. And you know that Dane Cook knows her. He's toured with her. So you want to approach him for tickets. But it's Mm -hmm. kind of awkward because (laughs) there's been this whole controversy where he's been accused of stealing a couple of your jokes. So Mm -hmm. you're in a really awkward spot. So Mm -hmm. you're meeting with him, and this excerpt starts with Dane Cook talking. Mm. 2006, that should have been like my triumph. And I enjoyed it, Louis, for maybe two months. Two months before it started to suck. Because everything I read about me was about how I stole jokes from you, which I didn't. I kind of think you did. Dude, why would I steal three jokes from you when I have hours of material? Why? Why would I do that? Risk my reputation? Because they were funny jokes. You know what, Louis? You know what the biggest lie in the world is? That I'm a rock star, I'm a millionaire, I'm, I'm, I'm a comedy bohemoth, and you, you're like a comics comic, and you're an inside joke guy, and I'm a sellout, and, 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 and I sold my soul, and you have, you have artistic integrity, and you're a, you're a good guy. We're in this room right now, you and me. You're looking at me. You let your name be used to hurt me. And now you're sitting here asking me to use my fame to get you tickets to Lady Gaga? I mean, how do you feel right now? Very. So you admit that this is all bull. I want to know what I think. You I don't think that you saw me do those jokes and said, I'm going to tell those jokes too. I don't think there's a world where you're that stupid or that bad a guy. I, I, I do think, though, that you're like you're like a machine of success. You're like a like a rocket, and you and you're rocketing to the stars, and your and your engines are sucking stuff up. Stuff is getting sucked up in your engines, like birds and bugs, and some of my jokes. I I I think you saw me do them. I know you saw me do them, and I think they just went in your brain. And I don't think you meant to do it, but I don't think you stopped yourself either. And that's why I never felt the need to help you not be hated by a lot of people. Okay, this is Louis C.K. <laughs> and Dane Cook in an episode of season two of Louis C.K.'s series, Louis. So this is based on, on a real in- incident. Um, what made you think of actually writing it into your series? Well, what's interesting is that it's not a real, it's an incident that never happened. He and I never had that meeting. But, um, I mean, but he, but, but he had... was accused of stealing your jokes. 
That's right. Yeah, he was. And, and we were on these two sides of this crazy thing. Um, it was like one of the first YouTube uh, grudges matches, you know, where people would post his joke and my joke. And then everyone would comment who they thought stole what and, you know. Um, but I always had a very ambivalent feelings about it because um, he's a human being. And I always felt a little weird about the whole thing. You know, I felt like I, I felt what I, you just heard me say. Uh, but I didn't. A lot of people just said he's a horrible thief, and he was so vilified that it was really hard to watch happen. But um, anyway, I don't know. I started to think about him as I was writing season two, and I thought it would be interesting to uh, have us talk about it. So I sat down and I thought about the things I've read him say in the press and heard him say, and I thought I channeled him. Like I thought, if I can make him the sort of the winner of the debate, or at least an even match, then it's worth doing. Um, letting him call me a fraud was really fun. It's so much more interesting than, like, I could have made him a straw dog or had somebody play him and gotten off on myself by saying, you stole from me. But it was way more fun to be, to have to go into someone who stole from me, supposedly, and have him call me a fraud. It's just so interesting. Um, so I wrote it up and, and I called, I wrote Dane an email and said, I wrote something. Do you want to read it with me? And he came to my office and we read it out loud together. And he said, I'll do this. And he all went all in. He let, he wrote, I wrote that exact verbatim. He wrote, read everything the way I wrote it. And he he asked for a couple of changes, and I said, no. And what he did said, he I'll ask do for? It. Um, he wanted to be lighter. He wanted to be less angry. He said, I'm not angry about this anymore, and I don't want to represent myself that way. And I said, well, the way you want to represent yourself isn't my lookout. I want to tell a story that's dramatic and interesting. And he saw that as valuable and said, sure, okay. So he kind of, I think he kind of went back in time a little to get that anger up. Um, and probably he's got some little residual anger, and I had some residual anger. So we both got to sort of say our thing. And then it was unresolved. That was the important thing to me is that we said both of our things, and then it sort of laid there between us and didn't really go anywhere. So how did the episode change your relationship with Dane Cook? Well, we had a great day doing it. And I, I was profoundly impressed with his commitment to it. And I liked spending the time with him. And uh, so we email. We've emailed back and forth. He recently lost, uh, uh, we lost a friend in common, Patrice O'Neill, the comedian, died. And uh, I dedicated my special to him. And Dane and he came up together in Boston. So we've, we've re shared feelings about that and stuff. These are all things that wouldn't have happened before we did this episode. I want to talk about another episode uh, from season mm. two. And this one was with Joan Rivers. And in this episode, mm. you're playing the lounge at an Atlantic City casino. Mm -hmm. And you're doing jokes about the lounge and about Donald Trump, who owns the lounge. And the manager says to you, you can't do those jokes. You can't insult Trump. You can't insult the casino. And mm -hmm. you decide to take a principal stand and not compromise as a comic. And so you quit. And mm -hmm. then you see Joan Rivers, who's playing the main room, and you sit down and you're having a talk with her. And she is just really shocked that you mm -hmm. quit. And she thinks that's a really stupid move. So anyways, here you are meeting with her, and she speaks first. You're in the lounge. Well, I was. You were fired? I quit. What do you quit? Nobody quits. I quit. Are you crazy? Are you a trust fund baby that you quit? No, it's just that they got upset because I was saying stuff about the casino and I was making fun of Trump. And... You're in a Trump hotel. You don't make fun of the owner of the hotel. Are you crazy? He's not going to hire a comedian that's going to say, Donald Trump. I know, but I just... I... You know, this is not an easy business. I mean, you want to try my life sometimes? I work in Arizona. How about that? And Indian casinos. You think that's easy? You tell a joke they don't like instead of a tomato, they throw a tomahawk. But what do you expect? I mean, you got a job. How lucky are you, for goodness sakes? Yeah, but come on. You're in the nice theater here. They got me in the lounge. I was in the lounge, sweetie puss, two years ago. For all I know, I'll be back in the lounge two years from now. And you'll be in the main room. Things change. That's the business. Look at the perks you're getting. You've got a job. You got a card for the free food in the employee cafeteria. I mean, stop bitching and go buy yourself a, a, a pocketbook that's lined in plastic and throw food in when they're not looking. Yeah, great. You know what's wrong with you guys? You don't know when you're lucky. 
<laughs> and that's Joan Rivers and Louis C.K. from Louis C.K.'s season two of his FX series, Louis. Did you ever have a comic say that to you? Uh, tell me to uh, know when I'm lucky? Yes. Um, yes, yes. I remember there was a guy named Paul Kozlowski who was a comic. In